going to get started. Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Uh, exactly. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome um, Catherine Wiesner to the New York Forum Press Center. Uh, she is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Population, Refugees, and Migration. Um, just a, a few things, if you could just silence your cell phones. Um, and if you have a question uh, after she completes her remarks, please state your name and your media affiliation. Today's briefing is on the record, and with that, let me turn it over to Deputy Assistant Secretary Wiesner. Okay. Are you planning to um, transcribe this? Yes, okay. we will. Okay. Thank you. Great. So I think what you're receiving now are the um, joint statements that came out of the Leader Summit on Refugees and the fact sheet on the various commitments that were made, and that's um, what I'm here to talk to you today about the uh, for for us in the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration at the State Department, but of course for the um, Obama administration as a whole, the Leader Summit on Refugees was um, a main highlight for us of the UN General Assembly High Level Week. Um, we saw it and see it as an excellent complement to the UN Summit on Large Movements of Refugees and Migrants that was held uh, the day before and um, see the Leader Summit on Refugees as giving an opportunity for governments to immediately after adopting the New York Declaration on Migrants and Refugees to make concrete commitments that show that their tangible support for the principles and really the aspirations that are in that New York Declaration. Um, we were also extensively involved in the um, intergovernmental negotiations and the run-up to the UN Summit on the 19th. We participated in many of the events on the 19th. Secretary Kerry delivered our remarks, which you can find on the record. Um, so we take great interest in that and in the coming work to be done on developing the two compacts which that uh, declaration calls for to be adopted in 2018 on safe and orderly migration and on global responsibility sharing for refugees. Um, in addition to these two summits, of course, um, U.S. government officials from my bureau and many others participated in a multitude of events this week at the U.N. that focused on the global refugee and migration crisis and were organized around some of the sub-themes of the two summits, so whether it was about getting more refugee kids in school, um, telling refugee stories better, amplifying the personal stories of refugees, creating jobs for refugees, um, the role of civil society, the role of the private sector. Um, and then a number of meetings that have been held on individual humanitarian crises that have significant refugee dimensions, obviously Syria, also Iraq, South Sudan. I just came from a meeting on Nigeria in the Lake Chad Basin, as well as Yemen and events on um, ensuring the protection of women and girls in all of our humanitarian activities. So with all of these events, on uh, all of those themes, um, what are the outcomes? I think uh, to start with answering that question, I will return to the the, really the central purpose and the motivation uh, for President Obama to call the Leaders Summit on Refugees. And, and that was really to, you know, from a starting place um, of, of all of the focus on Syria and the movements of people from the Middle East to Europe, um, which has gotten a lot of attention and deserves a lot of attention and will continue to do so, but also to make it very clear that we understand that this crisis is global, um, that this global crisis is made up of a number of individual crises of displacement and conflict um, that deserve uh, similar attention. Uh, and that in responding then to this crisis, we really need to rally the world community to um, greater global responsibility sharing, that we can all do more for um, all of the amazing um, things that nations have done in the last year to respond to this crisis, that we, we can all do more on several dimensions, specifically uh, that we can follow our best intention, intentions and um, inclinations and welcome refugees into our own communities, that uh, the responsibility of doing so shouldn't fall on a few nations, but is for all of us to step up, step up and take part in. Um, and that we need approaches. Um, the, the, one of the major themes of the week, of course, has been, and, and the year, that uh, the length of time in which refugees spend in exile or displaced people spend away from their homes has just continued to grow. And, and it's too long for kids to be out of school, and it's too long for um, families and adults to be without the dignity of being able to provide for themselves. And so that means that we have to promote the self-reliance of refugees and look at the types of investments that make that possible and the policies that make that possible. You are probably familiar with, and if you're not, you have the fact sheet, um, the targets that we set in, um, in announcing the Leader Summit on Refugees and the commitments that we, we sought in support of those goals, um, the first being more humanitarian financing, and as President Obama announced, 
all of the uh, countries who participated in the summit, and I'll, I'll uh, reiterate that any country who participated in the summit uh, was there because they had uh, decided to make new and significant commitments over the course of this year, actually, towards the goals of the summit, and that was um, – that was the criteria for receiving an invitation. So those countries gathered, which included 32 donors, um, have contributed or have pledged to contribute this year, year $4.5 billion more than they did last year. A billion of that um, increase came from the United States. Uh, secondly, to increase the number of resettlement spaces available to people to leave countries of first asylum and settle and start a new life elsewhere. Um, that countries came together and doubled the number of spaces that were available uh, from last year to this year uh, with a, a approximately 360,000 spaces um, available to refugees in the coming years. And then finally, uh, focusing on uh, these opportunities for refugee kids to go to school and refugee adults to work um, with commitments towards a million more kids going to school and one million more adults with the legal right to pursue either formal work or a livelihood in their country of asylum. Um, we've been pursuing these commitments from various countries ever since the summit was announced late last year. So this has been a, a vigorous diplomacy effort over the last nine months. So the summit was both the culmination of that with uh, countries coming and announcing their commitments and also the start, um, particularly for countries who are perhaps starting new resettlement programs or uh, looking at changing and adapting their policies to integrate refugees more comprehensively in their societies. Um, so in, in, in pursuing these commitments over the course of the year, we uh, took advantage of a number of um, events. So the commitments that countries made and that you see cataloged in the fact sheet um, did start with the London Conference for Syria um, and commitments that Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey made to getting kids in school and, and, and um, creating more opportunities for refugees to work. Uh, UNHCR held a resettlement conference for Syrians uh, in April. Countries made commitments there to increase resettlement. So, so building on that and bringing in other countries, um, we ended up with uh, nine additional African refugee hosting countries, major refugee host uh, hosts in, on that continent, three from Asia, who are increasing commitments um, along with objectives of more whole. To give you just an example of the types of commitments that were made, um, you know, the goal is to get more refugee kids in school, but then the question is how to do that. And uh, part of the answer to that question is certainly resources, um, and that's where donor countries and refugee hosting countries need to come together. Um, but there are policy aspects to that as well, and that's where we, we really um, applaud those countries that came forward and said that uh, they would look at allowing refugees to live outside of camps, to access national government school systems instead of parallel school systems, to accredit uh, refugee education, um, to hire more teachers, all of the things that governments themselves could do. Um, and then many of them at the summit from Chad, Cameroon, elsewhere, then challenged the donor community to support that with resources. Uh, in terms of work, uh, the commitments range from um, offering formal work permits to making agricultural land available for refugees to pursue livelihoods. Um, and in some instances, in a number of cases, there were, there were sort of additional commitments made that, that improved the legal status of refugees overall throughout the country. So whether it was birth registration, uh, better identification cards that come with um, recognition of your status, um, and, and in a number of countries actually offering refugees permanent residence or naturalization. Um, and so millions of refugees actually will benefit from those changes. Um, getting back to this question of uh, sharing responsibility between those who have resources and those who don't, um, uh, I should also note that the president hosted 50 uh, business leaders in, in a meeting just before the summit uh, who all made commitments along the same lines to support refugees. Um, $650 million worth of commitments, but benefiting specifically 80,000 kids to be in school, and I think perhaps most importantly, um, commitments to create 220,000 new jobs for refugees. So it's one thing to say that refugees have the right to pursue legal work. It's another thing to actually have a job available to them. And of course, in creating jobs for refugees, we need to create jobs for host communities. What we're really talking about is an investment in communities and countries that create more jobs overall. 
um, and letting refugees contribute and be a part of those um, that economic growth. There are also a number of, of new platforms along this line that I want to note. The um, Education Cannot Wait platform was launched at the World Humanitarian Summit. The U.S. government was one of the first donors to that platform with a $20 million contribution. And um, this recognizes that even as we raise more money for humanitarian assistance broadly, um, not enough of those resources always go towards education. And so the, this is the first fund ever focused on um, education in emergencies specifically. And we look forward to a number of the countries who attended the Leader Summit and made commitments on uh, refugees' access to education to benefit from this fund and funds like it. Similarly, we worked with the International Organization of Migration and the UN High Commission for Refugees to establish a new fund for emerging resettlement countries. It's the uh, Emerging Resettlement Countries Joint Support Mechanism, I believe. And this is, um, you know, as we went around and did this diplomacy, we were talking to traditional resettlement countries like Australia and Canada who have increased the numbers that they will take in, but also countries that had never really done resettlement or had only done it on a very small scale. And um, this, the creation of this mechanism is in recognition that there are resource requirements for some of the poor countries who are deciding to do that, uh, but also technical capacity and skills that they could benefit from IOM and UNHCR helping them identify the most vulnerable or the most appropriate refugees for resettlement in their countries and preparing them for travel and then helping with um, designing integration programs upon arrival. So that uh, mechanism was established just last month. The U.S. contributed $11 million. During the summit, uh, Sweden announced a contribution of $17 million, the U.K. of 3.25. So we already have more than $31 million now available to these, new con these countries that have stepped up newly and said um, that they will um, accept refugees for resettlement. And then finally, in terms of new re resources being available, I want to um, acknowledge the really quite historic announcements that the World Bank made um, this week about establishing the Global Crisis Response Platform. And there are two financing facilities within that which will help uh, low-income and middle-income refugee hosting countries um, to invest in things like school and job creation for host communities that host refugees in a way that will um, promote the development of those communities and create opportunities for refugees at the same time. And, and, and this is, I think, a really important part of uh, the world community recognizing that uh, there are two sides to this responsibility sharing and that ultimately um, development finances will be uh, critical to us really achieving the goals of the commitments that were made. Um, so what's next? I think um, two things going back briefly to the uh, uh, UN summit. Um, we really hope that the countries who participated in the Leader Summit on Refugees will take that spirit of responsibility sharing, which was a rather ad hoc, you know, motivated by, uh, by the diplomatic engagement of the U.S. government and the other countries that co-hosted the summit that they will take that spirit of responsibility sharing back into the process of developing these two global compacts that, um, that the UN, the New York Declaration calls for. Um, and then, of course, we will um, be working very hard to make sure that uh, all countries deliver on their commitments um, that they made at the summit uh, to be building that into our ongoing diplomacy and engagement. The UN High Commission for Refugees has a big role here, um, civil society and others, um, and we'll look forward to taking stock um, as we often do a year later uh, through some kind of ministerial conference to, to see where we are. So I think I'll stop my introductory comments there, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. The floor is open. Please. Hajime Matsuro, Japan, Sanke, forgive me, actually from 35, so I would like to shoot two questions. Uh, Japan made a commitment um, of um, 100 million, and how do you describe um, this commitment uh, for the first time, and would you, uh, do you think uh, Japan will be more appreciated if the country starts um, accepting um, refugees directly uh, to resettle in the, in the country? Second question, um, um, since um, the summit was named leaders, how do you describe the leadership of other uh, Security Council members such as China and Russia with that regard? Okay, so I think the $100, $100 million, um, commitment that you're talking about Japan, Japan made was specifically to the um, Global Concessional Finance Facility, um, which is one of those uh, World Bank instruments that I just mentioned. Uh, and that is for middle-income countries who are hosting refugees. So uh, it's both Jordan. I thought it was 2.8 billion. Yeah, so overall, uh, there's a much larger, that's what I'm saying, a much larger um, 
uh, financial commitment to humanitarian assistance that J Japan made. And so we, that was, you know, a, a, a huge part of us meeting our goals. So mm -hmm. we, we, we recognize that with Japan. You asked about, um, and then there was a specific commitment to the World Bank facility, yeah. which was also very timely. Right. Um, and then you asked about resettlement. Um, would you be, I think with the uh, just to say, would be more appreciated uh, we start inviting the refugee themselves uh, to resettle in the country. Yeah, we we um, we did um, make it an explicit goal of this summit that um, richer nations um, not only contribute money but also look at opening their doors to refugees. And uh, we would be very pleased if uh, if Japan would look at increasing its commitment towards resettlement. If you translate this 100 million to the numbers of the value of the uh, people who will be, will be resettled, uh, with 100 million, how many people do you think uh, refugees uh, re refugee can be resettled in other countries? I think it depends on the t time or the, the country. Right? Yeah, and I think this 100 million is actually focused on investment in, in right. countries of first asylum. Okay. And the leadership of China and Russia? Um, well, uh, China was at the summit as a participant based on commitments that they made. Russia was at the summit as an observer based on uh, their role in the UN Security Council. Um, you know, I think the I think the leadership that was shown at the summit was shown by the people, the countries that stood up and made significant commitments. And um, it was, you know, President Obama himself mentioned, uh, acknowledged a number of smaller countries like Portugal that will do more resettlement. Um, Zambia committed to integrating uh, refugees locally, and and I, we we feel that the summit was about really highlighting um, the leadership that exists um, outside of the Security Council. You know, far beyond um, far beyond that. <clears throat> Manik Mata, I'm a syndicated journalist. Uh, I was recently in Europe specifically in Germany. There's a movement going on within Germany, and you must have followed the elections. The AFD scored a fantastic victory. But the point is that they are talking about relocating refugees to what they say are cultural regions. That means they should go to, to countries or regions where they feel comfortable in terms of culture in terms of upbringing or what have you. And by that, very specifically, they were referring to countries such as Saudi Arabia, UAE, uh, Qatar, and, and a few others who have taken very few refugees. How, how does the U.S. Uh, react to that? I, I don't know that I can react to the specific German policy recommendations that you're talking about. I, I well, there's a demand. It's not a policy recommendation yet, but there's obviously a lot of pressure yeah. on the government. I mean, we our resettlement program, we resettled, uh, we will have resettled 85,000 refugees this year. We're aiming for 110,000 next year. We've resettled 3 million since 1975 in the United States, and they come from all over the world from all regions of the world, all cultures, all religions, and, and they come to the United States and they uh, make their home and they go to school and they uh, work and open businesses and join churches and mosques and, and other religious institutions. So, I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm, I think the U.S. view is that uh, refugees can find new homes anywhere. And, and yes, we are a particularly, um, we're known to be a melting pot in the United States, but I think you see the, you know, you see the same in many countries that, um, that integration is possible and it, and it requires some work, but uh, I don't think we would su subscribe to any view that certain refugees should be only resettled in certain places. Compared to the, uh, to the number of refugees taken by Turkey or even Germany, which accepted more than a million last year. Mm -hmm. uh, the figures look very small, U.S. figures. You know, I just came across something. Uh, yes, on page three, you had about uh, 85,000 last year. Mm -hmm. And they had three million last year. 
That's absolutely true, and that's why uh, increasing resettlement was one of the three goals. Resettlement opportunities was one of the, the three goals of the summit. There is a distinction between offering asylum when people arrive at your borders and choosing to invite people to travel to your country for resettlement. There is a distinction there. We also have people who arrive at our borders and airports and request asylum, and, and that's a different number, and it's much higher, actually, uh, annually. How than, do you differentiate between number. asylum seekers and refugees? What's, what's the basic difference? So the asylum seeker is somebody who arrives at your border and requests asylum, and if granted asylum, becomes a refugee. But our resettlement program is one where we identify refugees who, um, who've been given that status already somewhere else, overseas, generally. Um, and then we identify the most vulnerable f to come to the United States and, and basically restart their life there. So we recognize, of course, that, that Turkey has received huge numbers of people, that Germany has received huge numbers of people. I think what's important is that Germany has also committed to uh, taking refugees for resettlement. So they will also take refugees from Turkey for resettlement, from Italy for resettlement, and from other places around the world, from Ethiopia and elsewhere. Germany continues to invite people for resettlement. And those are, those are two different um, uh, um, programs. And, and one is an international obligation to provide asylum, and the other is, is quite voluntary to, to offer resettlement. Sorry, I'm late. Hi. I'm Dulcie from Pass Blue. Uh, what is stopping the U.S. Um, from taking in more refugees or asylum seekers? Why is the, that number so low, as you said, among the 65 million? Well, I can tell you that the, the increase from uh, 2015 to the, the new number of 110,000 administration announced uh, just a few weeks ago represents in and of itself a 60 percent increase over two years, almost a 60 percent increase. So similarly to doubling the number of slots that are available worldwide in the, in the President's Summit, it's, it's significant and also um, not nearly enough. It's a drop in the bucket. UNHCR has um, said that they believe that approximately 10 percent of refugees worldwide would need resettlement for different vulnerability reasons. and. Uh, because they're not safe in their country of first asylum or they need other types of assistance. Um, so the, you know, the, the slots that we're able to offer and that we've been able to mobilize globally do not come close to that 10 percent, but um, nevertheless, I think in the last few years, you've seen dramatic increases and we need to continue to, um, to try to push that. I mean, the constraints are, are bureaucratic, they're financial, um, but, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've invested in, in being able to meet the numbers that we have set for ourselves. So how much does it cost to resettle one refugee? If you say they're financial, can you put a dollar amount on? We can't really put a dollar amount on that. Um, there's there's money that goes federally. There's money that goes at the state level. Um, the State Department provides the first three months of assistance. There's other assistance that that comes in. The ha Health and Human Services uh, has a responsibility as well. Um, the Department of Homeland Security that does all the admissions interviews has staff and, and resource requirements and then all the security checks. So there's a number of U.S. agencies that are involved in bringing refugees to the United States. Um, uh, Ahmed uh, Rahimi, uh, the uh, charged bomber, uh, was involved in a case that took place in our neighborhood last weekend. Um, he was, he is the uh, son of a uh, former asylum seeker from Afghanistan. And we also see a number, increase in numbers of so-called homegrown terrorists <coughs> on, our so, uh, on the U.S. soil uh, who's are the, either a descendant or the first generation of asylum seeker. I was wondering how this incident, especially as it, since it took in our neighborhood, uh, affected this conversation and that, or uh, if you could read in the future, uh, how it would uh, affect um, this dialogue. And how would you, um, Prove the uh, the value uh, of uh, uh, enhancing this program uh, overweights the risk of terror to uh, your constituents. Well, the, the individual you mentioned was not a resettled refugee, as you said. He was he was the the son of a, an asylum and an American citizen, and and actually that's not uh, terribly unique. I mean, we are a nation of immigrants. Um, we are a nation of naturalized citizens in many ways. So. Um, 
so, you know, we, we have, as every nation has, we have this sort of very small percentage of our population for whom violent extremism is attractive um, and, and who have um, responded and, and whom law enforcement is, is, is very busy in guarding against. Um, but from our perspective, the, the, the refugee admissions program is one which scrutinizes, uh, you know, refugees who come to the United States are scrutinized more than any other tra traveler to the United States. And of the 840, I think, refugees that have been admitted to the United States since 9-11, it's less than, less than one fraction of 1% have ever even been arrested or removed from the country for any concern of, of terrorism. So uh, we have great faith in our, in our vetting procedures. It's not to say that there aren't security threats amongst the American population writ large, but uh, we should recognize that that population is, you know, made up of many, uh, many U.S. born citizens um, or naturalized citizens that have come from various origins. And, and that's the nation that, that's, that's the fabric of our, our society, actually. And it's nevertheless a very, very small percentage. The summit was a big event, was well publicized. Where do we go from here now? Will there be another subsequent summit to, to assess, to evaluate whether the objectives were actually translated into reality? Thank you. Well, in terms of the, you're asking specifically about the leader summit on refugees. I yes. assume, right? Because there is a there is a two year process now that was sort of launched by the UN uh, in terms of the New York Declaration on Refugees and Migrants and the glo and the Global Compacts that will come out of that. And so that is something with in which the U.S. government will be very engaged. I think you know what what the what the Leader Summit did was try to produce some very and, and did produce some very tangible outcomes immediately. So as we talk about how we should come together as a global community to, you know, do more for refugees and share more, this, the intent of the summit was to do that today. So we, some of that money has already been delivered. Anything that hasn't been delivered, we expect to be delivered to humanitarian organizations, UN and the other. The money was delivered by the U.S. No, the money will be delivered by the 32 donors who made commitments to increase their financing from last year. And some of it has been, and that which hasn't been will, we expect to be. Uh, delivered by the end of this year. Um, similarly, these resettlement slots, we, we take in very good faith the commitments that governments have made, and we know that they'll face uh, bureaucratic and funding challenges in, in pulling it off, but, um, but we, we take those uh, commitments to make spaces available for refugees for resettlement in very good faith. And, and, uh, and then in terms of getting kids in school and refugees working, that probably is something that is worth taking stock of a year from now, because many of the commitments were commitments to change policies and do things, but um, in partnership with the World Bank, with donor resources coming in, and, and that will be the work of the, of the next few years. Um, countries in the Syria region have committed to getting all Syrian refugee kids in school, and that will not happen immediately, but they have made great progress since February, and we will continue to try to support them and mobilize others to make progress going forward. So I might have missed how much you said that the dollar amount was actually raised. Is there a total amount? So the, the target of the summit was to increase humanitarian financing from 2015 to 2016 by at least $3 billion or 30%. Or and the um, increase uh, of just those donor governments that participated in the summit was $4.5 billion from one year to the next. So they went from X to 4.5 billion for this year, or pledging for next year. The, the difference is 4.5 billion. So I actually don't um, have the baseline okay. and the. Okay, so that went above and beyond what you expected, right? Three billion. Yeah, billion. and it's also nearly not enough. <laughs> not nearly enough because you know going to all of you know these events, whether it be on Nigeria or South Sudan or elsewhere, there's a number of humanitarian appeals that are 50 percent funded. So. Uh, the needs have been growing, and we have been not keeping up with the needs, but um, but this significant increase will help. Um, the flip side, I'm sorry, I asked uh, Laura Kirkpatrick, and I also read for Pest Blue. Um, I have two questions. One is the flip side of the financial. I know that refugees on the civic and state level have a certain onus to pay back. How much of that, where does that money just go into the administrative of the, of the settlement services, or does it count? towards these long-term goals, too? Sorry. 
Um, the financial targets for the Leader Summit on Refugees focused on overseas humanitarian assistance. Okay. Um, so contributions to, you know, UNHCR, World Food Program, UNICEF, and the work that they do to support, actually not just refugees, but uh, internally displaced and all um, victims of humanitarian crisis worldwide. Um, but your question, I think, is a different question around uh, those refugees who are resettled in the United States who do pay back uh, the loan that they get for their, their flights to the United States, and they, they do that over a period of time when they begin uh, working and earning income in the United States. And that money goes back into the program. It does. Okay. So it kind of. Um, and the second was in terms of measuring it, and I'm sorry, it's the U.S., so there's a politics question. With the change of administration, will do you see the measurements continue to seek the same metrics, or? I mean, I think what the challenge will be, um, irrespective of a change in the U.S. administration, is for you know. I, for everybody to continue to marshal these resources and to increase them going forward. And, and that's the challenge. It, it, frankly, it took a lot of um, diplomatic effort to reach the point where we had 50 countries making the commitments that they made on Tuesday. Um, and again, we believe that those were made absolutely in good faith, but there is more to be done. There is plenty more to be done. So that same um, spirit of, of, of moving forward and doing more um, and finding ways to do so needs to continue. So that, that's the case not just in the United States, but in, but in every country and I think, you know, here at the United Nations as well. But I, I think he was asking who's going to do that? Who's going to make sure that it moves forward? Because it's, it seems like there's sort of a void, that there's sort of lack of leadership on this issue. And obviously the U.S. took the leadership helm for the summit, but there was nothing precisely said about who's going to do it next year or who's going to keep track of the process. That's true. I, I think there will be a follow-up meeting a year from now. Unfortunately, we didn't have that um, settled in terms of who will, w would host that. Um, so I think stay tuned for that. I thought yeah, Canada So that was not finalized. Ah, so. uh, okay. There was a bit of a... <coughs> I just have a very uh, fundamental question, mm -hmm. and that relates to the U.S. policy governing admission of refugees and asylum seekers. Until the Syrian crisis blew up, uh, there was no, no uh, sort of policy at all. It, I mean, it was a policy, but it was characterized by, by a very strong ad hoc element and only recently, people are talking about it in a very tangible way. Would you share that view? I might need you to restate the question. Well, okay, I'll give you very concrete examples. During the, in the aftermath of the, of the Vietnam War, the U.S. took in a number of refugees, and it has also been taking in more refugees, but in a very sporadic way. So until the time when the Syrian crisis blew up, uh, there was no proper policy. It was a very ad hoc kind of a reaction, depending on who was talking to you. And now there is a need to formulate, to, to give some kind, to provide some kind of contours to a policy that would have a long-term a kind of a long-term vision, if vision is the right word. Well, in terms of uh, admissions of refugees for resettlement to the U.S., uh, it's right that the numbers have, have gone up and down a bit in the last several decades. Um, since 2010, they have only gone up, um, and that was not just in reaction to uh, the crisis in Syria. That was this administration's commitment to continue to do more on refugees. Uh, in terms of global refugee policy, um, I think that that is why uh, the UN and the Obama administration focused on refugees with these summits here in New York this week, is to recognize that there, there has been an ad hoc response globally in that the countries that have borne the greatest burden have been the countries that have been closest to crisis. Um, and that that has um, become untenable. 
with countries, as, as, as you've already noted, like Turkey having three million refugees, um, Lebanon having one in four of their citizens be refugees, and countries in Africa that have hosted refugees for decades, um, and nobody has paid as much attention as um, they certainly feel has, should have been. So I think in that sense, you're right, that, that there's been a, an ad hoc response globally. Our major partner is the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, and they are there every time in every situation in many more refugee crises than any of us have ever heard of to respond to the protection and assistant needs of refugees. And the U.S. is very proud to be the largest supporter of them. But I think what, what the world and the U.N. has been looking at this week is, uh, is to really elevate that. Um, so they will be the lead in developing this compact the, uh, on global responsibility sharing for refugees. But the intent of that is to provide much more predictable responses <coughs> when you have large movements of people in terms of countries coming in with financing, coming in to offer resettlement, and uh, from the outset promoting the self-reliance of refugees so that they don't become dependent on aid uh, for many decades. So in that sense, you're right. That is the objective, is to have a much less ad hoc and much more predictable response to, to refugee movements in the world. Um, so this $4.5 billion that was pledged, does it go is it channeled through one to one source, basically, the UN? Or is it up to each country to say, I'm going to send money here and I'm going to send money there? It is up to each country. Um, you know, we're very supportive of money going um, to the UN and to international humanitarian organizations like the ones that I spoke about, and that was certainly um, a part of the diplomacy. So it's not bilateral aid, for example. You know, we're not counting any bilateral aid from one country to another. This is all money that goes to recognize international um, and, in some cases, local humanitarian organizations, but it would go to a, a wide array of them. I know you joined us late, but do you have any questions? Yeah, I do, actually. Um, and I'm sorry if it's been covered already. Uh, actually, it's a very kind of factual uh, question. Can you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Sebastian Mallow. I'm with uh, Thomson Reuters. And so, essentially, I'm, we're just trying to find out which 50 countries have pledged to take in more refugees and how much, how many refugees each of these countries um, have pledged to take in. Um, and I was kind of hoping that during this briefing, if I had arrived earlier, this would have been mentioned. Yeah, so unfortunately, I cannot provide you with a breakdown um, country by country. Uh, some, uh, many of the countries who spoke at the summit did um, quote figures in their remarks, so I can certainly direct you to the, the public statements that were made. Um, the criteria for being at the summit for those countries that pledged money and resettlement slots was a significant increase over what they had done in 2015. Um, so, so I think it's 18 countries um, uh, made a significant increase, and in some cases that was, you know, a traditional country like Canada offering 25,000 more right. slots or more than that. Um, and in some instances, it was uh, countries like, uh, for example, even though I'm not going to give you a breakdown, I'll give right, you an right. example. <laughs> um, countries like Slovakia, um, Romania, Czech Republic, Luxembourg, um, Argentina, they, um, they all committed to doing much larger numbers of resettlement than they've done in the past. So if they were in, you know, offering resettlement to several hundred refugees in the past, it's now several thousand. I mean, uh, I understand you can't give me a breakdown, especially right now uh, during this conference, but uh, can your office provide me with a breakdown after this event? I think, uh, I think it's unlikely that we will have that breakdown just because we relied on governments themselves to yeah. decide how they wanted to articulate their commitments. Okay. But um, if they're, you know, if we have, if we do end up with that analysis, um, then yes, we will. Right. Well, I might just be in touch with your office to, uh, if they can point me out, point me to, to those statements that you mentioned. Okay. That, that yeah, that's out. fine. Yeah. Yeah. And we can even, yeah. and we can also talk through sort of how, um, how we uh, sort of counted the increases from. Right. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Are there any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Just, I mean, it was very hard to follow the leader summit and really figure out what they're committing to. Uh, so. Uh, it's great you you actually might have a list someday <laughs> because uh, first of all it's hard to understand what a lot of the leaders are saying and then the numbers that they're tossing out it's easily um, misconstrued 
But, I mean, my impression was that a lot of money was being pledged, for example, mm -hmm. like China. Mm -hmm. But uh, the number of countries that were actually committing to resettling people was significantly much, much lower than the number of countries um, that were willing to, to donate money. It, was that the impression you got? Or? I don't think I don't think that that's the <coughs> that isn't the case. Um, well, we had 32 donor countries there. 18 of them made significant increases uh, commitments to significantly increase resettlement. Sorry, what was that number? There were 32 donor countries. Yeah. 18 of whom made uh, commitments to significantly increase resettlement. I think that that is in the fact sheet. Okay. Um, it's true that countries had employed different levels of specificity in their remarks. I, mean, I might point to Ethiopia, which was one of the co-hosts of the summit. Um, they were quite specific in their commitments, and, and those are those are public, and they, I, I think, actually provide a very good um, uh, kind of example of the types of things that countries committed to. Um, they committed to expand their out-of-camp policy, which is currently now only for Eritrean refugees, to refugees of all nationalities to benefit some 75,000, which is about 10 percent of their refugee population initially. So that means that Somalis, South Sudanese, Sudanese um, would also be able to benefit from that out-of-camp policy. Um, they are making 10,000 hectares of agricultural land available for refugees in host community households, which uh, they um, estimate will benefit up to 100,000 individuals. Um, really interesting in Ethiopia, um, they and the UK both announced uh, this new jobs compact, which builds on some of the models um, of the Jordan compact that were uh, that was rolled out in London in February where investment in industrial parks will create some 100,000 jobs in Ethiopia, and 30 percent of those jobs will be set aside for refugees. So that was an ex a really exciting development, and the World Bank and uh, the European Investment Bank, the European Union will all be involved in financing um, those investments. And so that was really exactly the type of um, cooperation that this, this summit sought to to foster, and I think that the event on the calendar provided a good forcing function for um, for that project to be ready to be announced. So that's one example. Well, I think that, that might be it. Thank you for attending today. Thank you so much for your time and uh, your remarks. We really appreciate it. Today's briefing was on the record, and the transcript will be posted to our website at uh, www.fpc.state.gov uh, later today. Thank you so much. Thank you. How do you remember the W?